tales for dark nights. It was 2012 when Hurricane Sandy hit the Northeast United States. New York City was fixated on a dangling crane in midtown Manhattan. Elsewhere on the coast, weird stories and photos circulated in the internet and social media. Most notably, a picture of a shark on the flooded front lawn of a New Jersey home. One of the more disturbing pictures I saw was that of a casket floating down an empty street. I've searched high and low for a copy of that photo, just to prove my story really, but I haven't found it since. Caskets floating away during a flood aren't a new thing, believe it or not. In New Orleans, the problem of airtight coffins popping out of the ground because of heavy rainfall became so bad, well, most graves are now either lined with concrete or they just build them above ground. Before Sandy, this phenomenon was unheard of in the state of Connecticut. I never saw it personally, mind you. I just saw the picture I mentioned in a few stories from patrons at the bar I used to work at. Problem with that is, drunks aren't exactly known for their honest storytelling, of course. But this story, the story I'm telling you, this story took place the day after the hurricane. The bar I work at is located on the outskirts of Waterbury, Connecticut. My boss called me and asked me if I could go check out the place and make sure it hadn't been damaged or looted. I said I would on the condition that I could drink for free when I got there. He agreed, not having much choice in being flooded in and all, and I was in my truck and on my way, figuring I'd spend my afternoon relaxing in an empty bar. There's something... Inherently creepy about a city the day after a storm. Major roadways are abandoned. Streetlights are out. One major intersection I had to go through simply had a stop sign stuck in a Home Depot bucket in the middle of the road instead of the usual working stoplights. The power was out, so most of the houses I passed were pitch black. Pure silence hung over everything with the exception of my truck's engine and the country station I was listening to. Only one word came to mind at that moment. Apocalyptic. I pulled into the strip mall where the bar was located. I locked up and moved towards the glass front door. The neon sign outside had been broken in the storm. McKinley's Gin Mill was written in hunter green gothic type on yellowing plastic. The break in the sign was in the top left corner where an Irish caricature grinned over a mug of beer. With the top left part of his head missing, a single remaining eye made his smile seem more sinister than sarcastic. I opened up and I flipped the switch. The light stayed off. Power's out, signs broken, but I couldn't see any other damage. I grabbed a green Jameson bottle along with my portable iPod player, kept under the bar, and made my way into the adjoining room. The way McKinley's was set up was as soon as you walk through the front door, you're in the bar room. The room had wood paneling and was decorated with photos, posters, signs, and scattered on the walls. Across from the bar was a five-foot gap in the wall that led to an area with a big-screen TV, pool table, and a jukebox. I put the bottle on one of the tables and set up my iPod. I enjoy solitude for the most part, and the idea of drinking a bottle of Irish and listening to music while casually improving my pool game was welcome compared to how I usually spend my nights. Noisy 20-somethings taking Instagram pics and comparing how drunk they are, well, I just put my chill-out playlist on and set up the table. I was maybe halfway through my second game when I heard the bell over the front door tingle. 
I put down the pool cue to the sound of a scraping stool. I walked back into the barroom and saw the man's back. You got a drink there, friend? He asked in a sing-song voice. I made my way to the shelf with all of the liquor bottles. The man was dressed odd compared to our usual clientele. He was wearing a dark black suit, like the guy had just gotten out of church or something. What's your poison? I asked. He wrapped his knuckles on the wood. Four roses bourbon, if he'd be so kind. Three fingers neat, if in you don't mind. I reached up to the top of the shelf and grabbed the dust-covered bottle. I took clean rocks glass from the bottom of the shelf before turning towards the man and pouring the drink. The man grabbed the glass and I looked up at him. That was the first time I got a real look at him. His suit wasn't Sunday best, as I had originally thought. Patches of it had rotted away. It was covered in patches of mud and dirt and pus yellow stains that shone past the black. The shirt underneath, which had once been white, was now a light brown, and the same sickly yellow blotches scattered about. But that wasn't the horrifying part. His eyes were glazed over white, with only evidence of pupils being putrid milk-colored dots. His skin was pulled tight against his skull like pale cling film. The right side of his face didn't even have that much. The bottom of his right eyeball was visible past a half-rotten eyelid. Cheekbone, jaw, teeth were all visible in a deep yellow color. He sipped the whiskey and brown liquor ran through the gaps in his teeth. <sighs> It burns. Very fine, friend. Very fine. Damn good stuff. He said with a half grin. I pulled back and the man gave a deep laugh. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. I must look a mess. Caught me reflection in a store window. Don't you worry. Don't mean you any kind of harm. Not to you, at least. I reached under the bar, my hand wrapped around a sawn-off baseball bat we kept in case of a robbery. If you're aiming to use that bat, you'd better make sure your first hit is true, friend. I don't want to hurt you, but I will. How did he know what I was thinking? Did he check under the bar when he walked in? Did he see the reflection in the mirror? But he answered for me. When you're dead, gone on sixty years, you start to see things no one else does, he said, pointing at his half-exposed eye. The eye sees all, I'm afraid. I see your heart racing. I see your knuckles whitening on that bat. I see you, Frank. My fingers tightened around the leather grip. He took another sip. I don't know how I know either. But please, friend. Put the bat down. I just got out and I just like a bit of friendly conversation. Grab a drink, pal. My dime. I let go of the bat and tried to feel the shelf behind me. I half swung my hand around until I felt fingers touch glass. I put another rock's glass on the bar top in front of me, not wanting to lose sight of the stranger. When a man with half a face, who knows your first name, asks to have a drink with you, you have three choices. Option A, try to kill him. Well, that wasn't a choice if he knew what I was thinking before I thought it. Option B is to scream and run. But run where? The police? Oh, I'm sorry, officer, but can I trouble you to take care of this zombie in my bar? Oh, yes, I've been drinking. Why do you ask? Option C. Have a drink. 
hope for the best. I poured myself a bourbon, trying to avoid staring at his face. Oh, you go ahead and look, the man said. And before you ask, I don't know I am here. Well, not air here. I'm air here to have a drink and some conversation. Here, though, well, there's a mystery. I woke up staring at Silk, clawed at it I did, screamed, screamed I did, and I don't know for how long. Could have been a day, it could have been sixty years. Didn't exactly have a calendar down there. All I know is the box I was in started to move. The wood was old enough that after a few hits I cracked it, ripped apart the top of me coffin and made me way up here. You can imagine it's been quite an interesting day for me, friend. <laughs> he chuckled. I drank deep and poured myself another. By the by, is East Windsor Road still tree blocks down? He asked. We... Uh, he, uh, no, it, three blocks down is, um... Uh, uh K K Kennedy Street, I responded. He looked confused. Kennedy Street, huh? And who's Kennedy? I'm talking tree blocks that way he said while pointing behind himself with his thumb. Um, yeah, that's Kennedy Street. Uh, and that's Kennedy, I said while nodding towards a black and white photo of JFK we had hung on the wall by the mirror. Kennedy, eh? Hmm. And, uh, what did he do to earn a place in that fine wall? I responded to the sixty-year-old dead man the same way I would a drunk patron. He was the first Irish Catholic president. The man laughed. <laughs> Irish Catholic president. Irish Catholic. Oh, by God. I would have loved to have seen that. Oh, oh what is? First woman president. <laughs> the first black president <laughs> the first atheist <laughs> I stared at him a moment I hope he's not a racist no, we, we have a black president now President Barack Obama he laughed so hard he almost fell out of his chair <gasps> oh oh <laughs> Oh, 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 my God, friend. <laughs> oh, that's rich. A black man as a president. <laughs> what a time. <laughs> oh, God. I've missed so much. He wrapped his fingers in the bar. Tell me, Frank, do you believe in fate, my friend? I shook my head. Well, I do, he responded. At least, I do now. Sixty years on earth. Only me to keep me company. And I know why, too. My pretty wife. Well, I guess pretty ex-wife now. She killed me. <laughs> he shook his head. I knew that stew tasted funny. <laughs> Anyways, me wife wanted to be with my friend Teddy. I knew at the time that they were running around together. One night I go home and eat a nice home-cooked meal. Next thing I know, I'm clawed at the ceiling. <laughs> he finished his bourbon. Dark brown trails on yellowed bone through gritted teeth. I'll have my revenge, though. Seeing as I'm going to walk down <laughs> Kennedy Street. Go right up to my old house and knock on the door and yell, Holly, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I see her face, 
Well, she won't be so pretty anymore. And I do so hope Teddy will be there too. Oh, that would be a proper homecoming. By God. He stood up. I pay you back, friend, when I get the chance. I seem to be a bit light at the moment. I'm sure you understand. Sir Lancia. Frank. He turned around and walked out the door. As the bell above the door tingled, I fell to the ground, trembling. I had finally composed myself a few hours later in the mid-afternoon. I locked up, texted my boss about the damage, and went home. I didn't sleep much. I ended up calling out of work the next few days. But with a combination of sleep deprivation and just repeating to myself that it was a bad Halloween prank, I finally found the courage to go back. Then, a week after my return, I was opening up when I found an envelope shoved under the door. Inside was a newspaper clipping about an elderly couple who seems to have been ripped apart by some animal. Also, nine dollars. Once I found out from the owner a glass of four roses cost three when they first opened in 1951, I quit and I left the state of Connecticut for good. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights